There's been an acrimonious global debate about where SARS-CoV-2, the COVID virus, came from. Was it an escapee from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where they'd been genetically manipulating bat coronaviruses, or did it come from a bat? The row hasn't been helped by the lack of transparency of the Chinese government and the failure of a WHO mission to come up with answers. A team of international scientists has tried to settle the issue by bringing together the current evidence, because either conclusion has significant implications. They argue that as we continue to navigate this pandemic, failure to understand the origins of the coronavirus will put us at risk of another pandemic. Nobel laureate Professor Peter Doherty is one of the paper's authors. Welcome back to the Health Report, Peter. Oh, thanks, Norman. What evidence was there to sift? Uh, the virologists went through it in detail. I'm not one of the virologists. I'm, though I've worked with viruses for years, my field's immunology. But people like Eddie Holmes and Sydney and a whole lot of people who uh, specialise in looking at viral sequences look very hard at the sequences and they couldn't see anything that suggested that it was either... Uh, a known strain or that it was a, a lab, a lab, a, that it was a engineered strain in any sense whatsoever. Now, whether it escaped from a lab or not, of course, you, you can't prove that really. If it's a, a virus that was isolated in the field and was brought to the lab and then got out of the lab, um, there's no way you'd know that against a virus that was uh, coming directly out of uh, out of bats and to people or some other species. So th the actual fact of this, though, is, uh, is, is given that the virus doesn't look as though it's been genetically manipulated, and I don't think anyone serious thinks that's the case, I, I'm not sure it actually helps us much, quite frankly, to know uh, whether it came directly into, into people through a, an intermediate species or directly from bats. If it did escape from a lab, it wouldn't have made much difference. It doesn't help us deal with the next one. What what we have to do is be watching those wildlife populations and expecting these things will come out of nature. Because in the paper you talk about this is the ninth documented coronavirus that infects humans and the seventh identified in the last 20 years. So there's form here. Yeah, absolutely. There's two. We knew about two coronaviruses in human populations before the year 2002. They're common cold coronaviruses. They also cause croup. But what I, I, I must say, since COVID-19, I'm really wondering whether they don't cause other things as well. But they've been around since the 1960s. The original coronavirus, which was named by a, a Scottish uh, electron microscopist called June Almeida, working in, in London, was one of those. And, uh, and then after 2002, suddenly, between 2000, 2000 and 2020, we've got five more human coronaviruses known. Uh, one was the original SARS virus, which infected people and then burned out. The two more common cold ones, possible one of them was circulating before we, we missed it. But then there's the Mears one in the Middle East that goes from camels into people, kills 30 percent of people, but not as infectious. And then we've got COVID 2 So something has dramatically changed since the year 2000. And basically, I think that is uh, is massive international air travel and passenger air travel, particularly out of China with an emerging middle class. And China has live animal markets and live bird markets. We know from influenza and we know from from uh, the original SARS, these places are extremely dangerous. So, so those are, that's the kind of evidence, that's the evidence for the animal spread. However, the lab was doing what's called gain of function studies, where they were taking back coronaviruses and changing their genetic structure in order to see what would turn them into a pandemic virus. And there has been a, a, a leak, I think the 1977 H1N1 influen influenza pandemic arose, well, it rose from a large vaccine challenge trial. So it's, it's, 1977, Norman, is like, uh, like when the dinosaurs went extinct. <laughs> it's a million years ago. There have been a you were just a lad then. Uh, uh, constraints and, and, uh, and control and regulation put into these high security laboratories since then. That 1977 escape, the suspicion is it occurred in the old USSR, and it was actually deliberate. They actually challenged people with the bloody virus. That was, if that's true, it was crazy. But there has never been a pandemic caused by a lab escape. And is, is that because, as people have said on the health report before, they're not good enough when they come out of the lab? They're just not good enough at actually ma manufacturing that? 
Look, a gain of function. You talked about gain of function. You know, the measles, mumps, rubella, yellow fever vaccines are all gain of function vaccines. We took those viruses, they passaged them through mice, so they gained a function to kill mice or to, or, or to grow in cell culture, and then they're attenuated for us, and they're, they're what we call live attenuated vaccines. I mean, this, the problem is this. If you blame it on a lab escape and you say there are evil people in the lab, and as we know, there are people who simply can't conceive that anything happens that's bad without evil people being involved. If you say the lab people are evil or incompetent, then you compromise our capacity as scientists to actually do the work that protects people. As it is, most of this work is done under very high security conditions. People are often working in spacesuits. This is incredibly hard to hard yards to follow so, and you know, to to insist on this that's it's not an impossibility but to insist on this it simply puts our gaze in the wrong direction and just finally peter doherty if, assuming that it does come from animals what do we do to prevent the next pandemic we we need some some definite policy changes we need to strengthen the who we need to insist that as soon as anything like this happens anywhere, that the country concerned, wherever it happens, is absolutely open. If it's a country that's poor and doesn't have high sophisticated science, as not un uh, China did, I mean, they've got fantastic science in this area. But if it's a poor country, we need a team of people who can go there immediately and help. And we also need to stop the planes flying out of that region, especially the pass passenger planes, right now, right then. As soon as it happens, you stop the planes. That's where the Chinese went wrong. It's not that it got out of the lab. It's that they didn't stop the planes. Nobel laureate Peter, Peter Presser, Peter Doherty, thanks for joining us on the Health Report. You're welcome, Norman.